And so one of the areas for me that has been a, a real fascination is to see the NIH criteria and then to ask all those questions of our database and our experience and see if the data bears out. Renal function. This is, has been known for decades that ongoing primary hyperparathyroidism will cause progressive renal deterioration. Well, creatinine clearance dropped by 30%. In 2002, down by 30 percent, and then in 2008, it was changed, according to the the CKD uh, new terminology that's used, to a decrease in creatinine clearance to 60 milliliters per minute. I have to say, of all the criteria, this is the one nationwide. Jim would probably say the same thing. We don't think anyone really references this with any regularity at all. I almost never see this commented upon, commented, commented upon by your colleagues in endocrinology as part of what they're thinking when they evaluate these patients. This obviously bone mineral density gets many um, citations and articles written about it, but let's look at the main evolution here. This is obviously, yes, what everyone's worried about. Is their is there patient developing osteoporosis? We have learned, and many studies have now shown, this is a progressive disease when it comes to the skeleton. And that's where these patients are headed, is they are headed to progressive bone loss. We found out that the bisphosphonates really don't help that. They don't, they're not effective in this particular population. Well, the way these scores were de uh, derived, in the 1990 conference, the Z score is what was used. The reason the Z score was used was the panel thought that what you were looking at, a Z-score would tell you your, where you stand as someone with this disease compared to your peers, the other people your age and sex, that don't have this disease. Well, then you move on to 2002 and 2008, and uh, those are referenced as T-scores because it's a reference back to peak bone density in early adulthood. And that, more accurately, would predict fracture risk a departure from your peak bone density, and that's why it moved to that. And they, they spell that out pretty explicitly in each of these different um, publications that they issued for this. So T-score minus 2.5 at any site and or a previous fragility fracture. Now this one, I would bet everybody here has definitely broken this rule. And they spell it out for you. Preoperative localization tests should not be used to make confirm or exclude the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. Preoperative localization tests should not be used to make, confirm, or exclude the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. This is, uh, this is something not just you guys, not just those in Mississippi, Tulsa, Boston, or Chicago. It's everywhere. And that's one of the things that is a great challenge for us as people that take care of just this disease. Scan, all scans are not created equally. Most of them are done quite poorly. Jim is going to really talk about this in, at length in a little while and in depth. But this is one I bet you within the last couple of weeks. Everybody here is, has probably used this as part of what they do to work up. If there's a tumor there, we ought to see it on the scan. You, not likely to unless your facility does these all the time. In general, these, these criteria are reactive. Has the patient reached osteoporosis? Has the patient gotten a kidney stone? Has some threshold of, of serum calcium been reached? The issue of their 50th birthday, has that come around? Or have they reached it yet? And quite honestly, you guys are ahead of the curve. We get to see how everybody practices. It's back to what I said at the beginning. We get to be, we get to be at the bottom of a funnel. It's a great place to be. We get to see that the people in California and Illinois and Texas and Phoenix and again in Tulsa and Topeka and all these places, the move is away from this. As patients continue to come back to you and say, I'm exhausted. I can't remember anything. I'm miserable. I'm walking around in a fog. 
I don't feel like myself. I feel old. And their calcium levels are 10.4 and 10.3 and 10.6. They're asking that something be done about it. And you guys, in general, in Florida, our endocrinologists in Florida have a great deal to be proud of because you're really kind of ahead of the game here because a lot of you guys don't really follow this. Someone gets to minus 2.2 on their bone density, that's plenty enough for a lot of you guys. If their calcium level happens to be 10.5 and they're complaining of all these classic symptoms that I now believe are classic symptoms of this, you'll go ahead and send them and I think you're all to be commended for that. Well, back to the panel didn't have data, there's plenty of it now. You, I've run off a bunch of these references that you can pick up at the end of the lectures today. Be happy to, to, to go to the literature and find them. I did want to go through ad nauseum all these percentages and everything right here. But overall mortality is increased in people with ongoing primary hyperparathyroidism. Myocardial infarction risk, myocardial calcification, valvular, cal valvular calcification in the heart. LVH gets plenty of it of articles written on it in conjunction with primary hyperparathyroidism. EKG abnormalities, hypertension, impaired glucose metabolism, metabolic syndrome under the cardiovascular risk factors, hypercoagulable state, it is coagulation factor four, calcium. Breast cancer is higher risk in these patients. Prostate cancer, aggr particularly aggressive prostate cancer, 2.7 times higher risk in patients with this than those who don't have it renal cell cancer, squamous cell cancer of the skin, colorectal cancer, all have higher risks in large studies from this than in patients who don't have this. Quality of life in a measurable way with such instruments as the SF36 is able to be seen to decline and to improve after parathyroidectomy in these patients. Renal dysfunction we've talked about many times. So what the NIH panels didn't have, what they didn't have access to, we're, you kind of lose track of time. It's 20 years later, and we have it now. We have plenty of data to tell us that this disease, in my mind, I would tell you, this disease, it's not caused by a cancerous tumor. It's caused by a benign tumor. But this disease follows a malignant course. It has a progressive deterioration on many different organ systems causes the patients to live not as long as their peers. And if I could get anything across with this particular lecture, it would be that our move, it's already underway. And those of you that, that I was speaking of at the beginning, that the groundswell of clinicians that are trying to figure out what to do with these patients, you're already figuring this out on your own. You already have seen Am I really going to just kind of wait until the lady gets osteoporosis? Am I really going to just wait until the calcium shows up at 11.6? This doesn't make sense to me. She's clearly symptomatic. She's, she comes in complaining every other week. We, move, we have moved now to monitoring fracture, from monitoring fracture risk to trying, to trying to avoid the fracture risk. From monitoring the creatinine clearance and seeing if the renal function is declining to trying to preserve someone's renal function. Accumulating cancer risk, the clear move would be to minimize that risk. Improving someone's quality of life, improving the mortality rates. If I could say it in, any, in the clearest way I could, we have so many diseases, and you guys treat some of them, that we don't actually have a cure for. We treat them, we manage them, we try to keep complications from those diseases from developing. But there are, there are a lot of diseases that we can't cure. And this is one that's caused by a tumor that once you remove it, the patient's cured. And they're very unlikely to ever get it again. And there aren't that many diseases that we can say that about, that we can truly cure, check the box, and turn the page. Thank you very much.